Amen. All right, guys, ladies and gents, you are released. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I love our kids. Amen. Amen. I think I lost my PowerPoint. <laughs> All right, we're back online. Amen. Good morning. We are back to round two um, of this current series, uh, part of the Back to Church, National Back to Church uh, series, and we are talking about what it means to be together as a church, and we are looking at and exploring uh, from the book of Ephesians what it means to be together. Amen? And so we, uh, last week we, we looked at some things that, that Paul was given to us, and he's given, given to us some great insights. You guys remember the Legos from last week? Uh, um, I, I didn't get to share a whole lot of that message because God just took our service in a whole other direction, which was okay with me. Um, but we are to be connected together and uh, just like Lego pieces, um, and God is building something awesome with that, amen? With each of us being connected together, God is building something, and he's the foundation, he's the cornerstone, and I'm just excited at what God is building um, here in Corning, California, amen? Amen. amen. Uh, before we get into the word this morning, I want to play a little game with you, if that's okay. Um, I, I told our first service, I said, you know, we're, we're a church that's a little bit different than your normal churches, and that's okay. Um, and if you don't n know that we're that different yet, stick around long enough and you'll find out uh, we're a little bit different. We're peculiar people, right? That's what the Bible says, uh, that we're peculiar people. And so I want to play a little bit of a, of a game with you this morning, and it all relates to the message. Um, I'm going to give you a word, um, and the first word that pops into your mind that goes along with that word, just say it out loud okay? Uh, first service nailed it. Let's see if you could do better. All right, here we go. You ready? Salt. No cheating if you were in the first service. <laughs> that ain't fair. <laughs> or if you watched online the first service and then you come in. Salt and pepper. All right, here's the next one. Peanut butter. Jelly. Nobody said burgers. Uh, peanut butter is good on burgers. Peanut butter and jelly is good on burgers. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's good. D hey, don't knock it till you try. We have a rule at our kitchen table with our kids. You have to try it. You have to. If we put it on the table, you have to at least try it. Uh, my second oldest boy, Tony, I remember when he came and stayed with us for a year. Uh, he was about 11 or 12 years old, and um, he didn't like broccoli. And we served broccoli. We, our kids love vegetables, you know, our girls do, and Brussels sprouts and all that stuff. And so we put broccoli there. And I told him, I said, you can't leave the table until you at least try it. He sat there for like an hour <laughs> until he tried it. And I even threatened, you'll eat it for breakfast if you don't at least take a taste of it before you leave this table. <laughs> he took a taste of it. <laughs> all right. Um, no. <laughs> I don't think he did. I don't, I don't, I slept since then. Um, all right, peanut butter and jelly. All right, Batman, Robin. All right, you guys are doing awesome. How about this one, Adam, Eve? All right, good, good. Hide, seek. Man, you guys are just real quick. Y'all had coffee this morning, didn't you? All right, here, here's another one. All right, pros and cons. All right, we'll see if you get this next one. Every day. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> Amen. I had to throw that one out there. Amen. Uh, there's, there's so many words. We could, we could do this all day long. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have that kind of time to go through all of that. But um, I do want to uh, ask you this question. And you don't have to say it out loud. But when people hear the word church, what do they think of? Religion. Religion. Love, there's all kinds of different answers for that, right? All different kinds of answers, and everybody's not going to have the same answer when it comes to the word church. If you go out into the world, into the community, and you ask them, what do you think of when you hear the word church? Everybody's going to have a different answer uh, for that, and um, it just depends on 
you know, what your experience is in the church, because there's been some good experiences in church, right? Um, but there's also some negative experiences that some have had over the years. Um, I've had both. I've had good experiences. I've had bad experiences in the church. And then, then, then there's some, some, somebody might say, when you hear the word church, they might say something in between the two. It all depends on what uh, their experience is with the church and how they're going to associate the word church with that word, whether it be negative, positive, or somewhere in between. But what if, what if somebody, when they hear the word church, the first word that pops into their mind is love? What if love was the very first thing that they popped into their mind when someone said, what do you think about when you think of the word church? And so, this week, uh, what I want to do is I want to challenge you to, um, to, to consider what would it take to build an inseparable link between church and love. That when somebody mentions the word church, they automatically think of love. They don't think about the negative experiences or even the positive experiences or anything in between, but when they hear the word church, the first thing that they come to their mind is love. And that's a tough thing to do. It's a, it's a tough challenge. Would you agree? It's a tough challenge. Um, and so the question is, how do we get there? How do we get to the place where people, when they hear the word church, they automatically associate it with the word love? L let's make it a little bit more personal, bring it home a little bit. When people hear Harvest Christian Center, do they even think of the word love? And if not, then how do we get to the place where we're out in the community, we're talking with friends and family, and we're speaking about church, and automatically they think of the word love. And so I think, I believe, that the first step in order to make this happen is that we first must experience that love. Because let's face it, you can't give something you don't have, right? Right? If you don't have 50 bucks, you can't give somebody 50 bucks, can you? No, you got to have 50 bucks to give them, right? Anybody got 50 bucks? I could use 50 bucks. <laughs> right, you got, you got to have it before you give it, right? So we have to experience the love of God, the love of Christ first before we can give it out to others. The Bible says in Luke 6, 39, he says, Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? Two people that, 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 in other words, you can't give something you don't have, right? We must experience this love first as individuals and together before we can give it out. Before the world, before our community, uh, you know, before we uh, go out and ask them, what do you think of the word church and what do you associate with that? We've got to be able to show love, amen? We've got to filter that love out of here, but we have to experience it for ourselves. Amen? And so today we're going to explore this concept of together we experience love. Today, together we experience what? Love. And so we're going back to Ephesians and where Paul was writing this letter to the church in Ephesus. And he addressed the same topic of how we as believers can experience love. Amen? And last week, we, 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 I mentioned a little bit about Ephesus uh, to you guys, but not too much. Like I said, God took it in a whole other direction. But Ephesus was a church that was multicultural, multigenerational, and they lived in a culture where God was not really welcomed. Christ was not welcome. And, and we live in that culture today, do we not? Would you agree with that? We live in a time where God is not welcomed in a lot of places, and Jesus is not welcome. And we are kind of like Ephesus. We're multicultural, multigenerational. And that's a good thing. Amen? Well, I love it that we are that way. We, we reflect our community that we are in. 
That means that we're doing something right. God is doing something. We should always reflect the community that we are in. Amen? And so I'm glad that we do, and I'm glad that God is moving in, in that way. And so um, the question is, is how do we uh, uh, figure out, how do we interweave into our lives our, the direction that God has got us going in, and, and, and how do we live out our faith in Christ in our community? Um, and last week, we, we, we looked at how we are to do this together, that we're not called to be alone. We're not called to do this alone. We're not called to walk this walk alone. Amen? And so uh, we are committed together. At least I hope you are. You're, you're here. <laughs> Most of you were here last week. If this is your first time, I hope you come next week. Uh, but we're committed together on this journey that Jesus has us on because it is a journey, amen? It's a path that we're on. Some of us are a little bit farther along than others, and that's okay. Um, no matter where you're at, we are called to do this together. We're called to be committed to this journey together as we follow Jesus. And together, we can experience God in amazing ways. And one of those ways is through love. We can experience his love together. Now, Paul, he wraps up his description of God's redemptive work, which is uh, bringing back together humanity and God. That's the redemptive work through Jesus Christ. Amen? Because man was separated from God uh, at the fall in the Garden of Eden, and God had initiated this plan of bringing back together God and and mankind, and he did that through Jesus Christ, and that's his redemptive work. And in Ephesians, after Paul describes all of that, in Ephesians 3, he brings it back to God's amazing love and the life-giving flow or life-giving work that flows out of that love. Listen to his words. He says this in Ephesians 6, 3, or, or sorry, Ephesians 3, verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you be rooted and grounded in what? Love, right? He wants us to be rooted and grounded in love through Christ, right? And he says uh, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. I love that last part. That, that God's desire for us is to be filled up with his fullness. Amen? That, that how many of you want the fullness of God in your life? Amen? I do. I want the fullness of God. Everything that God can give to me, I, I want it in my life because that means it's less of me and more of him. That means that when people see me, they don't see Pastor James, they don't see James, they don't see a father, but they see Jesus Christ living in and through me. That's my desire. That should be your desire uh, as we follow Christ, that we get the fullness of God. And, and part of that is to know the love of Christ. Amen? We need to know the love of Christ. It needs to be rooted in us. It needs to be grounded in us. It needs to be a part of who we are so that when we leave out of these four walls that those in this world can experience the limitless love of God because God's love is limitless. I, I mean, you think about what Paul is saying here. Um, he says that, uh, we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth um, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. And, and if you can think of the widest, um, the widest area, you know, the, the widest uh, piece of land or you, you think of the, uh, the widest ocean, God's love is wider than that. You think of the tallest mountain that you can think of that we have on this planet. I don't even know what that is. 
um, you know, the tallest mountain, God's love is higher than that. We could go to the deepest uh, uh, ocean and go to the deepest part of the earth, and God's love is deeper than that. And you can go uh, whatever the longest line, the longest, longer than the line at the BMV, God's love is longer than that. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? I know the one, y'all are laughing. You're the ones that didn't apply online to get your tags on time, right? So now you got to go to the BMV and get them, um, right? But his love is longer than that. We cannot comprehend how much love God has for us. He, we can't comprehend how much God has love, uh, how much love God has for you. His love is limitless, amen? There's no end to his love. Now, how awesome is that? Amen? That, that's good news to me, right? That should be good news to you that no matter what you've done in this life, no matter what you've done in the past, no, what you're gonna, no matter what you're going to do tomorrow or, or the next day or, or next week, God loves you regardless. He loves you. You can't earn his love. It, it's a part of who he is, and it's limitless. He's not going to love you any less because you did something wrong. He's not going to love you any less just because you messed up and made a mistake. That's awesome. That's good news. That's very good news because you think about you do somebody wrong in your own life. They want to cut you out. You're out of the will. Right? You're out of the family. We're done with you. We're cutting ties. God doesn't do that because his love is limitless for us. Amen? Amen? And I love that this limited lust, uh, love that he has, this limitless love that he has, we can experience it together and we can model it together to this world as the church. Amen? Because this love that he has for us, it's a love that's meant to be shared. We're not called to hang on to this love. We're called to share this love with those who have yet to experience. It is meant to be experienced together together. This is why God sent Jesus to this earth. He wants to share his love with us. And so he sent his, his son to die for us. Right? For, God, for, so, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen? It's because he wanted to share that love with us. And it doesn't just stop with us. It goes on and it continues in our relationship with one another. And it goes beyond the walls of the church as well. And we bring it out into our community. And it's together that our, our ability to grasp God's love for us, it deepens. Because when we gather together, we can see a reflection of God's love. When we, when we come together like this. We see God's love working in and through other people because God dwells inside of us. Did you know that? God dwells inside of us. The Bible says that uh, we are the temple of God and that his spirit dwells on the inside of us. You know, we, we, this is a church building, but this is not the church. You're the church. I'm the church. God dwells within us. Yes, he comes into the building when we invite him in and his presence is here. The Bible says where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is among them. But it doesn't have to be confined to these four walls. We are the church. Amen? Yes, we come here and we worship together and we need to do those things. Uh, the Bible says not to forsake the assemblies of ourselves uh, as we see the day approaching, meaning we need to get together more often so that we can see God working in and through us. Amen? We as individuals, we house the Spirit of God and we house the love of God on the inside of us. Therefore, love, His love, is present when we come together. And as we gather together, we experience His love in tangible ways, right? When we gather together, we don't just come together and, and you just hear me ramble on for 45 minutes to an hour. You guys engage in conversations before service. You guys engage in conversations after service. You guys pray with one another. You support one another. You encourage one another. You're there for one another. And, 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 and you, know, you experience God's love together. Amen? 
And even when God's love or even love itself is cloudy in our own eyes and we don't see it in our life anywhere else, when we gather together like this, we begin to see it in other people's lives. And we notice, hey, there's still love that is there. God's love is, I don't see it in my life right now, but I see it over there and I see it over here and I can experience that, right? It's not about coming into a building. It's not about gathering in a building. It's about coming together in, into the shared expression and transformative uh, experiences of God's love. For example, last week's service was a perfect example of that. God took over. There were people here that were broken. And they needed a touch from God. They needed God's love in their life. And we allowed God to flow in the service. And the altars were full. And people were up here praying. I I was praying with some people, but not just me. Others came forth and began to pray with others. That's God's love working through other people. You can't experience that at home by yourself while you're scanning through preachers on TV. You can't. It's okay to watch preachers on TV. It's okay to listen to the word being preached at home. But there's something about us gathering together physically. Laying hands on one another to pray for them. Offering that encouraging word and speaking into other people's lives on the behalf of God. It's the love manifested when we come together. God's love. Amen? And you, it's, it's just different than when you're by yourself. Amen? We see it, and it transforms people. If all we did was show up once or twice a week, sing a few songs, and clap our hands, and and greet one another, and we walk out of here like nothing happened, we miss the point. Amen? We can get that kind of stuff going to the YMCA. You know, you can get that in a bar if you really want to be honest. But you're not going to find God's love in those places. Not like when we gather together for a specific reason. Amen? To get into the presence of God. We gather together with expectation, with an openness, and with tons of grace. We need that grace. Amen? And we need to let our guards down. We need to let our guards down before God. And when we let our guards down in front of other people as well, things begin to happen. If we come in humbly, recognizing that, you know what? I need help. I struggle. I need forgiveness. I I need strength. I'm not doing very well right now. We reach a vulnerability that allows us to be known and to know God and others authentically. Authentically. Authentic, how do you say that? Authent- authenticity. Thank you. It's a rare quality in the church. I know it is. I've been around this thing for 20 years. I know it's a rare quality in the church, and it should not be that way. The church should be one place where we can come in and let our hair down. You do. <laughs> Aaron says, see, I let it all down. You don't even see it anymore. (laughs) Own it, man. Own it. This authenticity. What, What happens is we come into the church and we put on a mask. And people ask, hey, how are you doing, brother? I'm doing great. Bless God. And, you know, it's just awesome. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We go home, and we're broken. Because we don't want anybody to know what we struggle with. We don't want people to know we're broken and messed up. Especially if you're in leadership. Pastor ain't allowed to be broken. (laughs) He ain't allowed to mess up. (laughs) 
He ain't allowed to struggle. There was a pastor who took his own life not too long ago. I believe it was here in California. He struggled with depression. And people, the church, said he should have never been in that position if he struggles with depression. That breaks my heart. Because that right there puts pressure on pastors, that they've got to live this life. That, yeah, yes, I, I, I get it. We're, we're to be examples, and we are to you know, kind of set the standard, if you will, and have a godly relationship, and that, that's fine. We should, our, our leaders are held accountable, and we should hold them accountable, but we struggle too, and we should be allowed to struggle. Because we're all struggling. We all got issues. We all are broken at some point. And sometimes we lose faith at some point. Sometimes we lose hope at some point. And that's why we need to gather together, let it down, let it out, so that we can be healed through the love of God and the love of others and the grace. Because otherwise, if we don't allow that to happen, stuff like that pastor takes place in the churches. Amen? We need to be authentic with God, with one another. Because let's face it, the world is full of fake people. You don't believe me? Go online. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Those people who got those filtered profile pics, and you know what they really look like? And it's like, wait a minute, dude, you don't look nothing like that. What? Y'all know it. Come on. Right? You're friends with people online, and then you meet them in person. You're like, you're comparing the picture, the profile pic to them. It's like, that don't look nothing like you. Or you got those other people who post, and, you know, everything's fine. You, they got the big, happy family, you know, uh, and, and I love these, the, the, uh, the ones that, you know, you got, like, all the kids are just all nice and pristine and just behaving <laughs> you know it didn't that ain't the first take you know they took like 50 other pictures because them kids were fighting and fussing and nobody smiled at one point and it was just a complete mess but when we see it we see this perfect family they got everything together but on the other side of that computer they're broken and the world don't need more fake people the world needs genuine people to know that, hey, I can be saved, I can follow God and have struggles. It's okay. God knows we struggle. He knows that we have issues and, and, and he knows that, that we all, hmm, well, we don't have it all together. Amen? And the church should be one place where we can come in and be like, hey, struggling and then what do we do with the grace and the love of God we cover them amen you see if we're willing to acknowledge our own needs and our own weaknesses then we're able to receive the support and encouragement when we need it and offer acceptance and help to others when they need it you see the ones that don't want to offer the acceptance and don't want to offer the encouragement is because they're not willing to let people see their weaknesses. Amen? And, and so when, when we do this, that, that love just begins to flow in. And, and it's in those things that we'll experience the transformative power of God's love in our individual lives and in the church. Because when we love, we're tapping into the very nature of God. Amen? We're tapping into the nature of God when we love. When we, allow, when we experience his love first, and, and then you allow that love to flow out of you, you're tapping into his very nature. The Bible says in 1 John 4, Beloved, let us what? Love one another, right? For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. For what? For God is love. Notice the, the word. 
Notice how John uses this word. God is love. Not God has love. If God has love, that means somebody gave him the love. No, no, no. He is love. It's his very nature. It's everything that he is. He's the very definition of what is. God is love. And God and his nature cannot be separated. Love and God cannot be separated because it's one and the same. To be in a relationship with God through Christ, get this, is to be in a relationship with love itself. Because God is love. So we are in a relationship with love. How awesome is that, right? I love it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So th- think about this. If God is love and always was love, this means that everything from creation to revelation was born from and being shaped by that love. God created the heavens and the earth from that love. He created all the beautiful landscapes, the mountains, the oceans, everything in those things. He created all of that from love. Amen? Because he is love. And everything that that inhabits those places, he created it out of his limitless love. And God has created me and you out of that same limitless love. Because that's who he is. That's his very nature. And it is this love that has driven the creation of the world and God's relationship with humanity. And this love has fueled his care for his people through a world that has been broken by sin and enslaved by death. Love is his fuel. Do you have a passion for something? What is something that you wake up in the morning, you're just excited to do or, or whatever? Anybody like that? You got something in your life, like a hobby or something? I know Aaron loves cactuses. That fuels him. <laughs> Amen. Right? I remember there have been times in my life where I've gone through leadership stuff, and they, and they ask, you know, what fuels you? What gets you going? You know, what, 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 what drives you? And what drives God is his love. That's what fuels him. Right? That's what fuels him. That's, his, that's, that, that's everything that makes him uh, uh, of who he is, is that love. It's that, that same love that fueled the way of salvation and redemption in the form of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world, right? And, and, and he chose to become one of us and suffer and die and sacrificially take the place that we so deserved because he loved us. Amen? And because God is love, love cannot be a side note. It's not something extra that we throw on to the top of being a Christian. It should be who we are. Amen? It should be who we are. It it, it is God's nature And it's his plan for the world. It is his way for his followers, for you and I, that should define who we are. Right? Look what Jesus said. He said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have what? Love for one another. This world, Corning's not going to know that we follow Christ by how big of a building we have. Or how packed the parking lot's going to be. Or how many programs we've got going on. They're not going to know that we're a part of Christ and we follow God and, and we're a disciple of Christ by our happiness in life. Because happiness comes and goes, does it not? I give you 50 bucks and you're going to be happy. I take it away from you again. You're going to be unhappy. <laughs> Probably kick me. <laughs> give it back. <laughs> right? It's not defined by our happiness, right? People don't know that we belong to Christ by our successes in life. How many cars we own. or They will know that we belong to Christ by the love that we share with one another. We are to be recognized and known by our love. Amen? And so it's vital that we understand and grasp that this love 
is not to be experienced alone. It is, we should see this by now, that love is something that by definition is given and is shared. And love binds us together as one. And Jesus understood this, this concept. And therefore, when he prayed, he prayed this. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, meaning not just those that are with me at this point in time. He says, but for those who also believe in me through their word. When they go out and preach, when they go out and share the gospel, I pray this over them. So that means you. Jesus is praying for you that this would come to pass in your life today. He says that they all may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. This unity is birthed out of love. Because we have the love of Christ in us, that, that it's rooted and grounded in us, and the, the unity in the church comes out of love. If there's no unity in the church, there's no love in the church. And, I, and I've said this since the time I got here. There's unity in our church, and we guard it. Because there's a love in the church. Amen? When the church is divided, that means there's no love there. Amen? I've seen this happen. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. We're called to be in unity. Now that's a difficult thing to grasp sometimes, especially in our closest, uh, closest relationships. There are times when my wife and I were together, but we're not in, un we're not in unity. We're, we're not going in the same direction. There's a disconnect somewhere, Right? Somewhere in there, we, we kind of disconnected, and so we're, we're not moving as one. She's on one page, I'm on another page, and we recognize it very fast. When you've been in unity with somebody for a while, you recognize when you're not in unity anymore. And you've got one of two options. You can course correct and fix it, or you can ignore it and continue to divide. Of course, we recognize and we want to fix it. And she'll even come to me like, hey, wait a minute, we're not on the same page. We need, to, we need to course correct. We need to get back connected together. We need to be united together and go in the same direction. Because it's, it's hard to go in one direction while someone's trying to pull you in another. Amen? It's hard to do that. You're trying to go forward and they're pulling you backwards. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? So we need to course correct. Same thing what happens in the church. Once there's no unity, we got one of two options. We could either course correct, get back on the same path, or ignore it and there's going to be a division. We need to reconnect and move forward. Amen? So we can head down the same path. And we do that as one. And we do it together. And here's the thing. Just like in a marriage, you can feel you're together, but you're disconnected. We can feel that way in the world as well. Think about this. Right now, we're more connected to one another than ever before. We've got technology that allows us to connect with people all across the globe at any time, any moment, right? But yet, there's research and reports that remind us over and over that we feel more and more alone. They say the average Facebook user has 338 friends. They're connected, but they're alone. And I know we can sit here and we can blame technology for this and say, well, it's technology that's to blame. But if we're really honest with ourselves, if we're going to really be authentic with ourselves, We go to work, and there's people around us, but yet we still feel alone. We go to family functions, and there's people around us that are connected, but we still feel alone. We come to the church, people all around us, but yet we still feel alone. So we really can't blame technology for this. We really can't blame For being uh, technology for being disconnected, right? The question is, how can we 
be physically together but lack true connection and community. That's a total difference between night and day what Jesus has called us to do. Amen? If we are called to come together as one, we're not called to be alone. Amen? We're not called to be alone. Uh, The love that Jesus desires for us does not call for us to come together just to be alone. The love between Jesus and His Father is without separation, without boundaries, or without end. And we should experience something like that when we come together. Experiencing it is why we come to church. So we can experience that. That's the reason why God calls us together. Amen? But this leads us back to the question, how can we create an inseparable association between church and love? What can we do? And I know uh, a lot of times when we present problems, we just want one clear-cut answer. And to be honest with you, I don't have one clear-cut answer for this. You know, just like... Uh, uh, th- there are multiple issues in our community, right? Well, let's just take one of them just as an example. The homelessness. People think that there's one clear-cut answer for that. There's not. There's, I believe there's steps that need to be taken in order to eradicate that, to clear that up, to help with that. As with any other issue that's in the community, there's, there's steps. It's not one clear-cut answer. Same thing with this. It's not just one clear-cut answer, but I can offer you today a starting point for you. A starting point. And this is where personal responsibility comes in. Because we're all responsible. We have a part to play. Amen? We have a part to play. We, we all have... Uh, a part to play in our, um, in our walk with God. We have to work out our salvation, right? And so I want to give to you a starting point for where you can experience God's love together and live that love out all around us, amen? And, and the first one is this, connection. Where are you plugged in at? Where are you plugged in at? Are you plugged in? You see, the the church offers ample opportunities for us to connect with one another, right? We've got Bible studies. We've got small groups. We've got men's meetings and ladies' meetings and, you know, even in between the two services. Ample opportunity for us to connect with one another, to meet together, If you come in to the church, you say, well, I feel alone. Are you connected? Again, we've got to take the first step. See, the problem and the struggle is this. We're waiting for so-and-so to take the first step. And while so-and-so is waiting for you to take the first step, and therefore nobody's taking a first step, therefore you're not getting connected. Does that make sense? If we're called to love one another, that means that I've got to connect with you. Right? And so I want to encourage you if you're not connected, get connected. Just show up. Ladies, show up to a ladies' meeting. Second Tuesday of every month, same time, 6 30. They've got great food <laughs> and great fellowship and the great, great word. They always have a good time. So, ladies, if you're feeling disconnected, you feel like you've got nobody to talk to in the church and, 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 and so forth, listen, I know that our church is about double the size of what it was a year ago, and that's fine. The way you stay connected is by stepping out. Men, same thing. We got men's groups. We got Bible study. And I guarantee it, if you step out, you'll find somebody to connect to. And somebody's going to be able to pray with you, encourage you, support you, and not judge you. That's where the grace comes in. And I know this because there are a lot of people here who have struggles. And are God's still working on them. Amen? Get connected. The second way is through comfort. 
I bet you if I went around this room right now and I asked everybody to give their story, I bet you that everybody here has got pain, struggles, and some kind of issue. Right? We're going to be honest, authentic. We struggle, we got issues, some kind of pain, heartache. Life is not easy. We know this. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you as your pastor, say, hey, everything's going to be fine. Follow Christ. Yippee. No. Life's hard. Life's especially hard when you got values now. When you hold up the Word of God as your standard against the world's standard. When the world's telling you to live one way, but God wants you to live another way, it is hard. Notice I didn't say impossible. It's hard. And we don't have to go through this alone when we struggle. You're not called to go through it alone. We can comfort one another, encourage one another. Every Monday night we have prayer, 6.30. There's always somebody there. Or 6 o'clock, sorry, thank you. 6 o'clock, even if you showed up at 6.30, they're still there. (laughs) 6 o'clock they're there. At any given moment, you can walk in there and say, hey, Bellan, I'm struggling. I need prayer. Who's ever over, they'll pray for you. They'll embrace you. They'll comfort you. They'll not fix you. Because they can't fix you. But they can call upon the one who can. Amen? We can call upon the one. Can you? Thank you. The one that can fix us. Comfort. Amen? What about parents who struggle with their kids? Parents, you got all the answers? No, I don't. There are some times I need help with my kids. Amen? And so we have an opportunity. We've, we've got online parenting classes, but, but, but go beyond that. If you need help with your kid, even grandparents, if you're raising your grandkids, there's people in this church who will help you if you're struggling with that. The support group, the comfort that's here, but you've got to step out. Amen? And this is the last, I love this last one, collaboration. How many of you know that two are better than one? Amen? Two are better than one. You can accomplish more. I'm a part of this collaboration um, with the Tehama County, and it's to care for from cradle to career, to making sure that those that are, that are, that are uh, from the moment they're a child, uh, a baby, until they enter into the career world, they want them to be successful. Now, I'm not a part of the educational system. I don't know much about the educational system. I've substituted once in a while before. Uh, That's about the extent of it. I don't know all the ins and outs, right? But I was invited to come aboard on this team to help make these kids a success. What can we do to help them along from from cradle to career that they'll, they'll go all the way through school, graduate high school, and either choose a career or go on to college? What can we do to help them be successful? When we come together as a church, we have many minds and many gifts and talents and abilities that come together. And when we come together to collaborate, how can we show God's love to our community? Man, we can do some powerful things. Amen? Because one person doesn't have all the answers. But together, we can come up with ideas. We can come up with ways to show this community the love of God. just like the Legos working together, piece upon piece. Each one of us is a part of that. Amen? We are God's, amen. You know, collaboration. I got one more scripture for you. Taylor, if you want to come on up.
whatever place or way that you choose to plug in, let it be the love of God that guides you and unifies us in our efforts. Amen? It is Christ living in us that allows his love to grow and flow in us. And it's always been God's plan for his people to experience love together and to be bound together in that love. Paul wrote this, last scripture, and oddly enough, it's in the, the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, he says this. But now faith, hope, love. He says, abide these three. Abide in them. But the greatest out of faith, hope, and love is love. I mean, think about that for a moment. Paul is saying love is greater than faith. Love is greater than hope. How can Paul make such a claim? I believe it's because he understood the definition of love. He understood that God is love. Amen? And that's the greater, greatest, greatest, whatever, however you want to say it, the most awesome thing that you could, that you can focus on is God. Amen? His love. And so here, here's how I want to pray over you this morning. If you need prayer, and these altars are always open. You can come forward. We'll pray for you. We'll pray with you. We'll encourage you if you need that. That's, that's what we're here for. Amen? doesn't matter what you got going on in your life. We'll, we'll, we'll pray for you. But I want us to take this love and take it out there into the community. Because God... He's, he's doing something here. And I can't explain it any other way than like riding a tidal wave and just going along with what he's got going on. Amen? <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I believe our community can use the love of God. Amen? There's a lot of hurt and broken people in this community that God wants to use you to reach them. Whether or not they come here, that's up to God. and That's between them and God. That's not, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to reach them for the kingdom of God so that they can experience who God is the same way that we do. And if they want to come here, great. We'll just adopt them into our family. Amen? And, and we'll just continue to love on them so that's what I want to pray for you this morning that you take this love with you into our community if you want prayer feel free to come up while I'm praying and, and we'll pray for you as well if you would stand with me this morning God we love you Lord I thank you for your love Thank you, Lord, that you, you sent your son to die for us. Lord, you showed your authenticity of your love by giving sacrificially. And Lord, my prayer is that we experience that love here today. But Lord, let us not Keep it to ourselves, for Lord, that love is supposed to be shared. Lord, my prayer is that that love, it overflows out of our lives and into the lives of those that are around us. Lord, with those within these four walls, Lord, our, our church family, Lord, that there's such a love and a bond between us, Lord, that we are so united together, moving in the same direction. But Lord, let that love not just remain in here, but Lord, let it overflow into Corning. Let it overflow into our workplaces, into our homes, into our schools and businesses. Lord, that your love would just permeate 
Corning that others may experience you. Lord, let us get plugged in. Let us get connected. And start building those relationships, the relationships that Jesus said would show the world that we belong to him. The love that we have for one another. Lord, that's my prayer over this congregation today. And Lord, I thank you. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Can I get some ladies to come up here and pray? Fanland, Judy, you guys would. Compares to this, what a beautiful name it is. 